Africa, as the popular expression goes, is not a country. It's a region of over 1.21 billion people, comprising 54 countries, around 2,000 spoken languages, and a huge variety of political systems and modes of governance. Some societies in it are highly networked. Others have among the world's lowest internet penetration rates. So talking about cyber policy in Africa is always going to be tough. We can't cover everything. But by the end of this video, we hope you'll at least have a better understanding of the key cyber policy issues in Africa and why they matter for human rights, the relevant actors and forums, and how to get involved. Let's start with a bit of context. Africa is home to the world's youngest population, a key driver in the region's rapidly growing rates of internet access. Millions of individuals are using social media and other digital platforms to engage on a wide range of issues. And from Kenya's technology city to Rwanda's plans to completely digitize their currency, there are lots of examples of digital innovation on the continent. But the digital age has created challenges too. Despite recent increases in internet penetration, inequalities in access persist both between countries and within countries. Four in five people on the continent still don't have access to the internet. Those who do face high rates of cybercrime and spam and often have to put up with slow connections at high prices. In response, many African countries are beginning to adopt new policies, regulations and laws. Let's look at the issue of access first. Lack of access is a problem across the region, but the causes for it can vary. Sometimes it's about markets. Monopolies in internet service provision are common across the region. In Togo, for example, there are only two providers, one for fixed access and one for mobile access. The result is an expensive, inefficient service which is out of reach for most people in Togo. But sometimes access can be deliberately restricted. With free expression increasingly exercised online, some governments in the region are using internet shutdowns to repress dissent and criticism. This might mean blocking access to a specific communication channel or the entire internet, and it often happens during elections, as we've seen in Burundi, Congo Brazzaville and Uganda. For those who can get online, there is no guarantee that their connection will be reliable or secure. Across the region, the rapid increase in the number of people, devices and systems connected to the internet has created new security challenges. This is pushing cybersecurity up the policy agenda. In October 2015 alone, a South African newspaper reported 6,000 cyber attacks against South African infrastructure, internet service providers and businesses. The primary cause was judged to be outdated software. Across the continent, it's estimated that 80% of personal computers are infected with viruses and other malicious software, a situation exacerbated by weak network and information security. Spam and criminal activity online is a major problem, with Nigeria considered one of the region's largest targets and sources of malicious online activity. The response has been a wave of new cybersecurity legislation, often specifically focused on cybercrime. Laws are currently under discussion in several and have already passed in others. In some cases, new legislative and regulatory frameworks may be necessary, but in practice, they can be problematic. Sometimes, these new measures are copied from laws in other countries or regions. This can mean they don't give appropriate consideration to local conditions. And the processes by which they are developed can be closed and exclusive, with critical stakeholders, particularly from civil society, shut out of the debate. In the absence of proper scrutiny and oversight, the resulting measures often not only fail to address cybersecurity challenges, they can even actively undermine rights. Take the Madagascan law on cybercrime. This was introduced under the pretext of combating online child pornography, but it prescribes jail time for insulting state officials online, potentially curbing free expression and undermining the right to a fair trial. Human rights defenders in Africa are resisting this trend. To address the challenge of protecting human rights on the internet, a civil society-led coalition has developed the African Declaration on Internet Rights, which outlines recommendations for internet policy development and implementation on the continent. And in the absence of formal mechanisms for engagement, people across the continent are using social media channels to mobilize protests and demand more accountability from governments. Campaigns led by civil society are helping ensure that laws criminalizing free speech are struck down. 
Engagement at the national level, where cyber policies, laws and frameworks have the greatest impact, is crucial for human rights defenders. Key actors at this level include national computer emergency response teams, ICT regulators, members of parliament, particularly parliamentary committees on communications, lawyers, the judiciary and intelligence and military actors. Where they exist, national cybersecurity strategies can be an important avenue for engagement. Strategies have already been created in 11 countries in the region and are in development in several others. Channels for multi-stakeholder involvement, like public consultations, are crucial to ensure human rights perspectives are taken into account in the development of these strategies. If these channels don't exist, human rights defenders should be prepared to ask why. Engagement at the regional and global levels is also important. An important framework for cyber policy debates in the region is the African Union Convention on Cyberspace Security and Protection of Personal Data. Its dual focus is important because it acknowledges that data security and the human rights provision that go with it are an integral part of cybersecurity policies. This could support human rights defenders in making the case for rights respecting cyber policies in sub-regional and national processes. The convention needs to be ratified in 15 African countries before it can enter into force across all 54 member states of the African Union. Each country would then have to pass new laws at the national level which are in line with its provisions. This carries both risks and opportunities for human rights. To make sure these new provisions are rights respecting, human rights defenders will need to closely follow developments at both the regional and national level. Sub-regional projects to harmonise cybersecurity approaches are also underway. Human rights defenders can get involved through their meetings, which generally include a wide range of stakeholders. Bodies dealing with technical issues are another important player in cyber policy development. In Africa, these include AFRINIC, one of the world's five regional internet registries, and the African Telecommunications Union. Both are important forums for discussions on fostering secure, accessible and reliable internet in the region. There are also many discussion forums in the region where human rights defenders can broaden their networks, collaborate with other stakeholders and learn about emerging cyber policy issues and examples of best practice. Global processes can also have a lot of influence on cyber policy in Africa. While there are various sub-regional agreements between governments on the continent, none of these provide the basis for mutual assistance and transnational cooperation in addressing cyber crime. This means the only legal instrument which can currently enable transnational cooperation on cybercrime enforcement in Africa is the Global Budapest Convention on Cybercrime. So far, this has only been signed by South Africa and Senegal, with Morocco and Ghana invited to accede to the treaty. But once ratified, the Convention can play a big part in shaping national legislation. Outcomes of discussions in forums at the global level, like the ITU, the London Process and the UN Group of Governmental Experts, can also have big implications for regional and national policymaking. While they aren't necessarily binding in the way that national laws are, these discussions set the norms which shape the wider cyber policy environment. We said at the start of this video that we wouldn't be able to cover everything, but we hope this at least provides a starting point for engagement.